Let me say hello to everyone. I'm here to talk about glucagon-like peptide number one, and the abbreviation is GLP-1, and it has numerous effects on different target organs. Uh, but let me start with uh, the description, what is called the incretin effect. The incretin effect is the fact that if you stimulate insulin secretion in healthy subjects, with oral glucose, as we normally do, or with intravenous glucose, that then you have a much higher insulin secretory response in healthy subjects with the oral administration of glucose. And the control experiment is the intravenous infusion of glucose aiming at exactly the same plasma excursions of glucose concentrations as you have seen in the previous experiment with oral glucose. And in healthy subjects, oral glucose will trigger a threefold higher insulin response than intravenous glucose. And this is because oral glucose goes through the stomach to the gut, is absorbed there, and during that process, incretin hormones from the gut are released that stimulate beta cell secretion. If you perform the same experiment in patients with type 2 diabetes, you don't see as much of an incretin effect. So there is a defect in the incretin system in type 2 diabetic patients. And that is expressed by the fact that you have almost the same insulin secretory response with oral glucose and intravenous glucose. So the question arises, what causes this defect the reduced incretin effect in patients with type 2 diabetes, and there are two possibilities. Possibility number one is that the hormones are not adequately secreted from the gut, but that does not appear to be the case according to more recent studies in the field. So there is enough GLP-1 and GIP around, but still the incretin effect is at defect. And the reason is that the moment you have diabetes, the moment your fasting glucose is in the diabetic range, you lose the ability of your beta cells to respond to GIP. And once this is lost, you lose your incretin effect. And since GLP-1 is an incretin hormone, it was studied looking for experiments that as a secretagogue, it can stimulate insulin secretion also in type 2 diabetic patients. And yes, it was found that in contrast to GIP, GLP-1 still works in such patients. And after that, it was found that it has multiple activities in different organ systems. Even within the endocrine pancreas, it does not only stimulate insulin secretion, it also suppresses glucagon secretion. It leads to insulin biosynthesis, and in some rodent experiments and in cell lines, it can induce proliferation of beta cells so that in the end you have an increased beta cell mass. And the other mechanism is the inhibition of apoptosis with GLP-1. So if you incubate beta cells with high glucose concentrations, with a lot of free fatty acids, with cytokines, with hydrogen peroxide, that will induce cell death and you could prevent that with GLP-1. Other effects are on gastrointestinal motility, primarily gastric emptying, which is very much delayed with GLP-1 and with appetite regulation. And I want to stress that it is GLP-1 entering the great circulation that has access to receptors in the brain and tells the brain, no, the appetite is lower, you have more satiety, you don't want to eat as much, so in the end, exposed to GLP-1, people will lose weight. Then there are cardiovascular effects of GLP-1, which I will talk about in a minute in more detail. And last, there is a biochemical effect of elevation in insulin and reduction in glucagon concentrations, which will affect metabolism at the level of the liver, muscle, and adipose tissue uh, to have less uh, glucose production by the liver and more uptake of glucose into tissue, which both lowers glucose concentrations. With respect to insulin secretion, there is one very special feature of GLP-1, and that is that it is acting in a very much glucose-dependent manner. So when glucose concentrations are low, 
there is no stimulation of insulin secretion. The moment you elevate glucose concentrations, then it has a very profound effect stimulating insulin secretion. And this is very much different from sulfonylureas like libenclamide, which also stimulate insulin while glucose concentrations are low. And this is complicated by hypoglycemia, which is never provoked by even an overdose of GLP-1 uh, in a clinical situation. Regarding beta cell mass, there are rodent experiments that exposure of animals for a short period as two days is enough to increase measurably beta cell mass. Other experiments have shown that after 10 days or six weeks, so relatively short periods of time, we believe that it takes a lot longer time in humans before you can even expect a change in beta cell mass with GLP-1-like agents. The effect on GI motility is mainly on gastric emptying, also on intestinal motility, and the effect on gastric emptying can be very profound, almost leading to a standstill in gastric emptying, which means no nutrients leave the stomach, no nutrients are absorbed, so there is no increase in postprandial concentrations of glucose and triglycerides, for example, uh, but this effect is lost over time when you expose patients to high concentrations of GLP-1 receptor agonists for a long period of time. Overall, in fasting type 2 diabetes, no matter how high their uh, degree of hyperglycemia is to begin with, we can normalize glucose concentrations within a few hours by stimulating insulin secretion and suppressing glucagon. In the cardiovascular system, there have been studies with GLP-1 itself, with exenatide, with liraglutide, and they have been performed in different species like rats, like pigs, and dogs. And I am showing you experiments with exenatide in dogs, and they have been performed the following way. Uh, an a, acute myocardial infarction has been induced by occluding a coronary artery, but through this artery, a dye was delivered to the myocardium so that you could calculate the area at risk. And after the experiment, the real necrotic area was also quantified, and then the degree of myocardial infarction was expressed as a dead myocardium relative to the area at risk. And if you do this with exenatide and with placebo, you see a smaller myocardial infarction with exenatide, with uh, GLP-1 receptor stimulation than without. And this is the uniform result that has uh, been reproduced several times in different species and with different uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists. There is also uh, experiments on blood pressure, pressure regulation. If you expose humans to exenatide or liraglutide treatment, Blood pressure falls by approximately 3 to 5 millimeters mercury. There is vasodilation in patients with type 2 diabetes exposed to GLP-1 receptor agonists. And so there is reason to believe that there are multiple beneficial actions on the cardiovascular system of GLP-1 and all the other GLP-1 receptor agonists. One interesting last feature is that in recent time, there have been experiments not only looking for ex effects of the intact molecule GLP-1, uh, 7 to 36 amide, as it is secreted from the gut and as it binds the classical pancreatic type GLP-1 receptor, but what has been found out is that in the cardiovascular system, uh, you can have effects of GLP-1 also in receptor knockout mice, so there must be some other signal transmission. There is also effects of the degradation product after DPP-4 has acted on GLP-1, and this degradation product is known not to stimulate the pancreatic type GLP-1 receptor. So we believe that there is a good chance that there will be a second receptor on cardiovascular tissue that maybe binds this degradation product preferentially and not so much of the intact original GLP-1. And such a receptor would probably be a very good target 
for preventing cardiovascular disease in patients with and without type 2 diabetes. Based on these activities of GOP-1, several ways of using it as an anti-diabetic treatment have been devised. Number one is the inhibition of the degrading enzyme dipeptidylpeptidase number four, abbreviated DPP-4. Under this circumstance, uh, it is still the endogenously released gut hormone GLP-1 that is active in treating uh, diabetes. And the last approach is incretin mimetics, which is other peptides that share some similarity with GLP-1 that are able to bind to the receptor but are not degraded by DPP-4 and have a longer half-life than the original molecule GLP-1, uh, the half-life of which is in the order of magnitude of one and a half minutes. So this is the prospects for treating diabetes with help of properties that were discovered for the original endogenous gut peptide GLP-1. Thank you very much for your attention.